So my name is Eric Seidel, and I'm here today to talk to you about Flutter. Before we get into that, since most of you probably don't know me, uh, I should give you a tiny bit of background about me. I have been a software engineer for <laughs> coming on 15 years now, um, mostly worked on the web, uh, on browsers, worked on both Safari and Chrome, et cetera. Uh, about three years ago, I helped found the Flutter team, which is what I now manage. Uh, and what we're going to be talking about today. So Flutter, if you haven't heard of us, our goal is to make it easier and faster for you to get to iOS and Android. In fact, our team's mission is to build the best way to develop for mobile. And you might ask yourself, why? Don't we have lots of ways to develop for mobile? Um, we do. There are a few rough edges. And in fact, we spent a lot of time at the beginning of this project talking to other teams who work on mobile and understanding their concerns. And we heard a lot of the same things, and maybe some of these will resonate with you. We heard that getting to mobile can be slow and expensive. Um, we heard that doing delightful things on mobile, which their designers want to do, they want to do, their users want, uh, can be hard. Uh, and that the platform diversity story of current mobile complicates this. And finally, that if you really want to reach all users, at least in the US market, uh, you have to develop for multiple platforms. And that can mean two or three teams. So we said to ourselves, in doing this, there must be a better way. Uh, the development should be fast. I mean, here it is. We're in 2017. Uh, custom should be easy. Uh, you should be able to trust that what you saw on your phone while developing is what your users see. Uh, and finally, that you should ideally be able to build things once and take that hard work to more than one place. Uh, so let me show you a taste of what we've built. So I'm going to switch over. I have an Android and an iOS phone. I'm going to switch over to the iOS one here. Uh, and so we have, we have this iOS phone, and I'm just going to launch one of our little demo apps. And the first thing that you'll notice, uh, you maybe it went by too fast. But of course, it just flies open, scrolls beautifully, hits every frame. There's lots of pretty little demos. Lots of little animations, et cetera. Um, but I can also show you this same app on Android if I switch over. Here's an Android phone, same story. Boots up beautifully, scrolls beautifully. You notice that this now looks more like Android. Different scroll behavior, different title alignment, different back behavior, et cetera. Uh, so these just look like iOS and Android apps. And they are just iOS and Android apps. Uh, but one thing that you may not notice is that Flutter is painting every single pixel you see on the screen, handling every single touch, handling every single gesture. And so I can do crazy things like this. So I'm on Android here. I go into our little debug menu, and I turn to iOS. And so now when I scroll, I get different physics. I get a bounce behavior. And when I go in, so this is, a, for example, an iOS style control, and I have a back gesture. All because we control every single pixel, every single gesture. And we're going to talk a lot more about how we do that, but that was a taste. So let's go back to our slides. So again, our goals. Uh, here we are in 2017. We want to build something beautiful, something fast. Let's talk about how we went about doing it. Uh, so we thought about these goals and what problems we were going to solve in the mobile space, uh, and we found some alliteration, maybe a thesaurus, and we came up with this list of things we wanted to solve. And I want to talk about, particularly because this is a tech conference, the tech that we built to solve these problems. So let's start with Fluid. Why do you care about Fluid? We want to build a fluid developer experience. We want to keep you in flow. We want to get you home early. Uh, this is the thing that most personally excites me about this project, um, in part because I am a software engineer and I like saving time. But I also like looking around at my colleagues and thinking about the hours of their day that I helped save, that I gave back to them. Because I have plenty of things in my life that distract me out of flow. I feel like fighting my tool chain should not be one of them, as so elegantly expressed in this comic. So let's talk about the tech. What did we build? Well, first big part uh, is that at a very low level of our system, we built in a technology that we called Hot Reload. You've seen other techs, perhaps, uh, with a similar name. I believe ours is a bit different. Let's talk a little bit about what this does and why you care. 
So hot reload, typical dev cycles, is you spend seconds or maybe minutes. We talked to teams inside Google uh, who had tens of minutes uh, dev cycles, waiting for Xcode to turn, et cetera, and then you get plopped at the first screen of your app. And then you scroll around and fiddle around inside the screens, and you find down in the 18th screen your bug. And then you go and you blindly try and fix it, and then you repeat this cycle. Hot reload is about staying at that 18th screen or fourth screen on this slide and just fixing it right there. And so I can show you this is our actual dev cycle, our actual time between code and device inside Flutter. And you can see in this GIF, I'm changing the color and saving, and it's immediately reflecting on the device. Similarly, I'm changing the logic of my app. And again, it immediately reflects on the device. This is very powerful. It saves you a lot of time. Uh, and also, I should say, this is because we built it so low level into our system, uh, and we built the rest of the system around, this is really works. This is the default way that you do development. And we test, and we record stats from the wild. It's fast. We know that it works. We know that people use it. In any case, there's a lot of very interesting technical details, which um, <laughs> we could spend an hour talking about. Um, but here's a taste, uh, and there are several YouTubes on this topic that you can watch and learn a ton more about how this works, how we make that magic happen. So another thing that I should talk about, uh, one of the lessons that I learned in doing this, is how much language and tool chain matter if you're trying to accelerate developers. Uh, and so we started out in one language and actually built two full copies of our system before switching. Uh, this is something I'd never done before. Here we were a year into our project and we were switching languages. Um, we started out actually with JavaScript. It didn't in the end work for us, and so we switched. And we went on an exhaustive search, tried lots of languages, basically anything we could bring to mobile, uh, and ended up with one that I didn't really expect, uh, but has turned out to work out very well. And that language you may never have heard of, because it's kind of small, it's called Dart. So this is a language that's actually in heavy use inside Google. It's one of the uh, accelerated growth languages right now. It's used to build really big things, multiple millions of lines of code that drive some core business for Google. We didn't really care about that, except that we knew that this meant that it was battle-hardened. It could scale. And then finally, this team, and this is a part that I did care about, cared a lot about productivity. And they had already seen big productivity gains in the web platform, which is where they were currently targeting. And we worked with this team to help bring this language to mobile. So we ended up really liking this decision. Uh, it took us a while to get there. But there's some really neat things that this language does that I haven't necessarily always seen elsewhere. Like, for example, this one. Uh, this language both has a fast development cycle, which you've seen, but also when it's time to ship, compiles straight to ARM code. So you just ship straight to the CPU, straight to the metal, to your users. Uh, it also has an optional uh, but strong typing system, which, again, those million-line apps or multiple million-line apps leverage heavily, and we also leverage heavily. It has a tree-shaking compiler, uh, which helps you to use a large code base, but then only produce a tiny binary out of it, only the parts that you use. Uh, it has generational garbage collection, which basically means fast. We do lots of tiny, tiny allocations, uh, and they're very cheap to make, very cheap to let go of. Uh, and finally, we found it familiar, easy to learn. If you've used Java or JavaScript, this will feel totally natural to you. A uh, final thing that I learned through this process was how important tools were. And I'm not going to read off all this to you, but we have spent tons of time building tools. Uh, if you want to accelerate developers, you have to build and invest in tools. And we have done that. So I want to show you what this workflow actually looks like. So I'm going to pop out of this into an editor. So Flutter supports a variety of editors. Uh, I'm just going to use IntelliJ, because that's what I happen to have on this machine. Uh, this is a bit like a cooking show. I already followed the template and, and, and did a create, but this is about two minutes into the process. We just didn't have to wait for Xcode to spin up for the first time. Uh, so here I've run this very first template app. I just have this little counter. Again, of course, it works on iOS or Android. I happen to be using the iOS simulator, but you could use whichever. And I just want to show you again that dev cycle. So if we change this to red, right, and I just save, and boom. If I go and I say, want to change this text, right, because that button is actually a fab, a floating action button, there again, appears right away, 
Same thing, I could add some text. Say things like, hi, strange loop. And there you go. Uh, in any case, this is the dev cycle. This is what you live in. This is what you do. Keeps you in flow all day long. And we'll show more of this in a bit. Let's go back and talk a bit more. So our second goal, second thing that we wanted to solve, uh, was that we wanted to produce a system that was flexible so that developers never had to say no to their designers. Um, this is, was in part due to direct requests from these teams that we worked with earlier, and part to us just watching the market and seeing what was happening. Gone are the days of yore where you just produce a cookie cutter, checkboxes and buttons, OEM widgets app. Now much more common is for folks to do very custom brand forward design. And these are just live apps pulled from the iOS and Android stores. And similarly, we also learned through this is that even teams which told us inside Google that, no, we're just going to do material design, we're just going to follow the spec, would still do custom things, perhaps without thinking about it. And so there's at least three things that are violations of the material design spec in this screenshot uh, that were very easy for the team to create because they had tools and matched what their designer wanted. So another thing that we learned, or how we went about doing this, how we created a flexible system was layers. Lots and lots and lots of layers. So this again came from direct developer feedback as we were starting this project. Uh, one of the developers put it that they felt like dealing with some of these systems was like they were dealing with an iceberg. That they had this tiny little API surface that they were allowed to use, and they knew that there were big powerful things buried under the ocean. They could see them, but they couldn't touch. And so we wanted to build a system that in a sense flipped the iceberg and put all the good stuff up under your control in the same language that you're writing in so you can jump to definition all the way down, you can edit it, et cetera. And so I'm gonna talk about some of these layers that we built. This is an extremely simplified layering diagram. We have lots of layers, um, but we're gonna walk through it. So starting at the bottom, this is our runtime API. These Dart colon APIs, we built one called Dart UI. This basically gives you a canvas, some accessibility hooks, a way to lay out text, um, some networking APIs, and, and that's about it. You can write at this layer, you end up typing a lot of code, uh, but you certainly can if you want to. On top of that, we have a rendering layer, which should be very familiar to someone who's worked in UI programming before. This is a stateful view model, very typical way. Of, the job of this layer is to do caching, to let you put a box on the screen, let you move it around, uh, to do layout, to do painting, to do compositing, that sort of thing. One of the drawbacks of working at this layer, and is typical for other view systems, uh, is that there are some complexities. Uh, a common one is that this sort of stateful view model has a create update separation. So you both, when you create the view, you have to write a second code path to update the view. And those can get out of sync, and that can cause all sorts of weird bugs. And so folks build layers on top of this, as you've seen for many years. Uh, the one that we chose to build was a widgets layer, and this widget layer basically handles um, composition for us. Everything at the rendering layer tends to have a widget as well, um, but widgets are how you compose those, how you assemble those into new widgets that you can reuse, et cetera. Our widgets la layer is very React-inspired. These are immutable widgets, short-lived ephemeral objects, <clears throat> and they help solve uh, some of these limitations of working at the view layer. Uh, it's much shorter to compose at this layer. It also has a very simple data flow. You just always create new widgets. You don't have to worry about updating them. And then the final layer I should talk about is the sort of layers of opinion, and we have several of these. We, for example, have some material design, which you saw already. We have a, a set of iOS widgets, which you so, saw a little bit of, called Cupertino. Uh, and typically, when you use this framework, you sort of build your own opinionated layer. So let's go back down and talk about some of the technical changes, technical innovations we made at these layers to do this kind of flexibility, to do the kind of speed that we wanted. So one is rendering. To understand rendering, you have to know a little bit about our pipeline. So Flutter has a very strict pipeline of how data flows through the system, starting at the vSync or user input, and ending out when we actually push pixels to the, to the GPU. The part that I want to talk about starts in this rendering layer. Uh, so rendering handles things like layout again, painting, and compositing. 
<clears throat> and one of the things that we learn in working in this uh, is that simple can be fast. If you start with simple, well-understood algorithms, <clears throat> or algorithms with well-understood properties, uh, you can build simple things and take advantage of those properties to go fast. So let's talk about, for example, uh, how we do layout and painting. It's typical in other systems to sometimes join layout and painting into a single paint phase, uh, or it's typical in layout to have a multi-pass layout where a single widget or a single view will walk all of its children to gather some information, and then we'll walk them all again to lay them out. Uh, this is in contrast to how things are done at Flutter, where we have an intentionally separated layout and paint and do a single pass through each. We walk all the way down through all nodes and all the way back up, and this allows us to scale to much deeper trees than you might be uh, used to in other widgeting systems. Another way in which we found simple is fast uh, is that we found that with very simple constraints, you can generate expressive layouts. So basically everything you've seen is done through a very, very simple constraint model of just basically min, max, width, and height. This is in contrast to, say, how UIKit functions. Um, UIKit uses a much more sophisticated or much more complicated uh, linear constraints model and then has a general purpose constraint solver to solve that. And we found that we can do something simple and very fast instead. Another w way that we did things differently here is that typically how you do repainting is that you collect the dirty wrecks. Uh, and then you repaint based on, based on that. And we found that in the modern mobile era, it was simpler and faster to invalidate subtrees because modern GPUs are very good at compositing and we can take advantage of this to go fast. This was actually a big speed win for us. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, more innovations, this time at the widgets layer. Uh, so one of the actual things that we did differently here, I don't know of any other React-style system where both the reactive layer and the view layer are written by the same team. And we got to take advantage of this uh, in building the system. Um, but before we talk um, more about widgets, you should know, again, a little bit of history. So I said I worked on the web for better part of a decade. When we started Flutter, I was still sitting with the Chrome team at Google. I was still steeped in the web world. And one of the things that was going on in that time was the extensive web manifesto. And if you've worked in the web, you might have run across this. Uh, this was an effort at the time, and there were a bunch of related documents, to convince standards organizations to focus on explaining the web platform rather than bolting on more features. And this is something that we really took to heart in building our system and maybe to the extreme, uh, and strongly favored composition over inheritance. Let me talk about what that means uh, and what that changed. So a case study would be padding. So it is very typical in these systems to have these sort of container objects that have lots of little properties that you set when you want to build up. So like, you know, divs are this way. Um, when, then when you want to build up uh, a complicated UI. In our system, we... Our, pa our, sorry, our, our container class, if you look at it, it's this cascade of if statements, where if you've set one of these properties, we instead just wrap the subtree in another little simple widget. And a perhaps crazy example of that, I don't know of any other system that has one of these, is we have this very, very simple padding widget. And thus, none of the rest of the system, except maybe container, have a padding property, because they don't need to. You don't need these cross-cutting concerns when you have this composition. Uh, sure, you can build your own widget and wrap in padding, but you build other widgets commonly out of lots of these little widgets. And this composition is all over the system. Uh, so here again in our animation system, uh, we have the animation system is built of lots and lots of little pieces uh, that again you can replace and you can add to. There's no locked box here. There's no, like, fancy animation system that would be so amazing if you could just specify your own curve. Of course you can specify your own curves here. So in our animation system, you generally start with an animation controller, which knows how to produce a stream of doubles. You then might connect it to a curve or a series of curves that consume doubles and produce uh, another stream of doubles. And then again, you can chain those to tweens, which know how to consume a stream of doubles and produce a stream of whatever, recs or colors, et cetera. A pattern that we find, uh, Strongly throughout the system. So flexibility. Let's talk flexibility. I want to just show you a live example here very briefly. If I switch back to my iPhone, uh, I can just show you an in-production app that takes advantage of this. So this, for example, is an app built with Flutter, shipped, 
and doesn't really quite look like iOS, doesn't really quite look like Android, but rather is their own different look and feel. And this is them taking advantage of this flexibility to build what they wanted to build. So let's go back and show you some of this composition. So if we continue down our little tiny example that we started with, high strange loop, and again, we never lost state. We still have our number seven in the, in the corner. We can uh, build more complicated things using this composition. So say, for example, uh, I sent this to my designer, I'm ready to ship my counter, and my designer was like, oh, I want a different floating action button that is more styled in the way that we do things. I want an explosion or something like that. Uh, we can build, of course, our own floating action button. There's no secret. So of course, we can just jump to definition all the way down and read the code, but you'll find it's very simple. Uh, it's not very, and you can just keep going. Jump, 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 jump. Uh, all the way, because again, all the code is written up at your layer of the system. Uh, but we can also just make our own. So we can just make this my fab, right? We don't need a tooltip, but we'll just implement this. I'm gonna use my fancy editor to splat out a widget. I don't talk about exactly these classes, but there, uh, there are more talks on YouTube that can explain all this to you if, you if you so desire. But we're gonna type one out. My fab, actually, I wanted um, a stateless widget. My fab, save, hot reload. Oops, boom, we crashed our little app. It's telling us that uh, we haven't actually implemented a constructor for this. We're constructing a my fab and we haven't handled this. And we could have learned this before we even hot reloaded because we could have looked at our live analysis that happens right as we type. Because again, I talked about the focus on tooling before. Uh, but we can just fix that. It's very easy. We just do a my fab, this on pressed. This child, we should, I guess, actually define those. So we'll have a void callback for on pressed. And we'll do a final widget for child, right? Now we send the sucker. Oops, we have another bug. What's it say? Aha, it's because we made them required arguments when it expects us to have named arguments. So we'll fix that. And we'll send it again, and there we go. So I'm back, I never lost state. I went all the way through that error. I never stepped out of flow. Um, but we're not drawing anything. And that's because if we looked at our, at our build method, we're just returning an empty container. So we could take this container, add our child that we're passed in. And now, again, milliseconds later, we're drawing something on screen. We have our little icon. So now we could say, wrap this, again, I'm using my fancy editor, in um, a new widget. When we, we think of this budding, we want it to float, right? So we're gonna have to, the way you float things in the material side of the world is you make a material. And we'll tell this thing to reformat, if I can remember the keystrokes. Oops. Okay, we'll, uh, we're gonna go ahead and add an elevation to this. Elevation will make it, I don't know, 12 sounds like a good number. And we'll give it a color, because our designer told us that they want the fab to be green. So we'll do colors green. And we'll send to the device. And now we have our little fab with a shadow, and it's green. But we can keep going. I just reformatted so this is all easier to read. Uh, for one, this fab doesn't yet handle presses. So the way that we do that in the material world uh, is we add a, an ink well, which is something that knows how to, here I'll use my fancy editor again, to wrap in a new widget. Ink well, we have a child, and the ink well also knows how to handle our on press. So we'll do our on tap and pass our on pressed. I know this feels a little magical um, because I have to do this so quickly to fit into our time. Um, but now we have, you can see, we've done very, very little typing. We're up to all of 10 lines. And we now have a functioning button. And we can complete this by giving our container the desired width and height. And I think, you know, we can send that again. And it immediately changes. And we go back to our material and we're gonna make this a circle. 
because I think that our, our designer didn't want a square button. Right? That's it. We're done. In all of whatever that was, two minutes and ten lines of code, we have built, we've rebuilt some core, uh, core control that we can now customize to our heart's content. This is just how the system works. This is how composition works in our system. So, let's go back to the slides. I hope you guys are ex as excited as I am about working in systems like this. I like when uh, the machine does what I tell it to. So the final thing that I want to talk about, the final um, part that we wanted to build was something that was faithful. Something that you could trust would deliver the designs that you worked hard on implementing on your phone to all the phones of your users. And so I want to talk about, uh, well, I guess we should start about why. Why do you care about this? Well, again, this came from those early discussions where we were talking with all these teams, uh, and they talked about things like that their apps would break due to carrier-based theming, um, that they would have to fight with platform and hardware differences that would cause their apps to look weird sometimes, um, that they also had frustration with waiting for their users to upgrade. They wanted to use some fancy new design or something like that, but they couldn't push that until enough of their users had upgraded. Uh, so, for example, I actually have kind of a counterexample of on this slide where you see this is a phone from 2012, two years before material design ever existed, that is running material design via Flutter. Uh, and you could imagine doing your designs and having that level of control and pushing to all your users now. And so the insight, the tech as to how we got there, was to go to the metal. This is something we realized relatively early on that we needed to build our own runtime, um, but we didn't want to invent, reinvent the wheel. And so we actually spent a lot of time on this, uh, searching far and wide uh, for systems that had already been battle-hardened. So we took some graphics, a part of the graphics stack out of Chrome. Uh, we extracted a bunch of text logic out of Android. Uh, and of course, as we talked about before, we took a language that had been uh, successful on the web and we brought it to mobile. And I should talk very briefly uh, about some of the changes that we made to these systems, because we didn't just take them uh, as they were. Um, but for example, for Skia, which is our 2D graphics library, um, we only use the GPU parts. Because again, we're working with 2017, right? Uh, all these mobile phones have pretty good GPUs in them. We also worked with this team to add color correction. So for example, even when you're shipping to really old phones, you can trust that your images look right. Uh, and similarly, we worked on adding a text library on top. And one note, sort of a thing that fell out uh, of having had built our own runtime was that then we were faced with all this portability, and it was kind of neat. Um, thankfully, again, so much of the heavy lifting is done by these component parts that we salvaged from other products. Um, for example, Dart is our CPU abstraction and has a lot of different technology in order to behave nicely on all these different configurations. Uh, and similarly, Skia, which implements a bunch of different backends to do the same thing for our GPUs. Uh, but then our tests worked everywhere, and our product ended up working everywhere. Now, we're focused on iOS and Android today. We don't really talk about this, but um, Flutter really goes all sorts of places. I've seen it run on watches. I've seen it run on set-top boxes. Uh, I'm just kind of waiting for somebody to send me a YouTube of them running it on their refrigerator, because I'm sure it can be made to work, um, which is interesting. And maybe we'll do something with that in the future. Uh, but a final insight, I talked about how it was important to get your designs intact to your users, uh, but it's also important to match the expectations of your users. Be faithful to their expectations on the platforms that they're running on. And we spent a ton of time on this. Uh, we started by making our pixels match, and it was important that our, our buttons looked all right, uh, and we actually found that users didn't really care about that when we studied that. Uh, we cared, <laughs> and so we still do it. Um, but users, what they cared about was that the feel they cared about that when they uh, tapped, the, the targets were big enough. They cared about when they moved uh, and then when they scrolled that it felt the same way that the rest of their apps felt, that the gestures felt the same. And so we spent a ton of time on this. We built all sorts of interesting tools uh, to make sure that we understood that, say, like this one is for scrolling, um, that we could tell you exactly how many pixels our scroll velocity differs uh, from the OEM controls, uh, for example. In any case, 
that's basically what I wanted to tell you. I hope that you uh, enjoyed learning about uh, the different problems that we're trying to solve, the uh, tech that we use to go about solving them. I should talk very briefly before I go. Uh, I know this is a tech talk, but we could talk a little bit about product, um, which is that this is a very new product. We just released or announced to the public uh, our alpha in May of this year at Google I.O. Uh, and since then, we've seen an explosion of usage. We're already up to um, over 100 apps, you know, with this brand new thing, push to play. And we've seen an ecosystem develop uh, over 80 packages in the Dart ecosystem that are very specific to Flutter. And again, as you saw, we've seen some big brands uh, already adopt us. Um, one was launched last month. This was Hamilton, featured on both stores, uh, over a million installs, and very well reviewed. Finally, I guess what I'm really here for, since this is, again, a tech conference, uh, is that this is all open source. It's been open source since day one. I like working in that environment. Um, but open source is all built on community. Uh, and we do have a strong and growing community. Uh, and I'm here to invite you. If this sort of stuff gets you out of bed in the morning, like it does me, uh, you please should come check us out. Uh, again, we have over 125 contributors to our main repository, and probably a lot more than that, if I counted up all the little ones. Over 1,000 people in our Gitter. Uh, this is a very active project, and we would love to see you there. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs> <laughs>